Everyone, it's Mike. It's Sunday, uh, Saturday, January 28th. It's around 3.40 New York time. This is my free YouTube channel. Please remember to like and subscribe to this channel um, if you like this video. Also, if you enjoy these videos, you can find them every day on my subscription service, Reading the Markets on the Seeking Alpha platform. Uh, you'll find a link to that uh, below in the description section. Um, so I just wanted to briefly touch on what I think is uh, going on with the price action in the S&P 500 and the markets in general. And then obviously we have a lot to talk about regarding the Fed meeting this week because uh, it comes at a kind of point in time where uh, things are going to get either significantly more out of control from the market perspective or the Fed can potentially rein things in and, and kind of get things back into order. Um, so first of all, I, I wanted to just point out to you that uh, my general thinking has been that this is a symmetrical triangle, and it may appear that that is no longer working because we've come out of the downsloping side of it. Um, and it doesn't typically mean that it's a broken pattern. It can just be that it's what's called a throwover. Uh, those tend to come in at the end of a rally. Uh, they tend to give the appearance of something that's breaking out uh, and then only to come back and around through the other side of it. Um, there's a potential, obviously, for that to happen this week if the Fed can kind of set things straight. Uh, if the Fed is unable to do that, then, uh, you know, clearly the rally probably continues on to higher levels um, because, again, this rally has basically been driven by the easing of financial conditions uh, and a weaker dollar, uh, and that's also allowed some uh, re-leveraging to take place. Uh, so the movement we've seen in the last two days was uh, particular, particularly peculiar uh, because we had that big um, rally off the 20th and the 21st, and then we had the big sell-off coming in after Microsoft, and then another big rally. Um, you can see how it sort of shapes out and draws into a you know, you can call it a rising wedge with another throw over here, or you can call it a diamond reversal pattern, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. I think it works nicely with the five counts with a throw over of its own. And you can see that we tried to break away from it. We came right back down to it at the end of the day, and that's where we finished. So, uh, again, you know, if this was a throw over, you would expect that we continue to move down. Now, obviously, we could move up a little bit. Um, but again, you would expect that we break through and come down below this uh, triangle and we begin to move back towards the bigger symmetrical triangle that's in place, you know, in the market at this point that ultimately leads to potentially lower prices. Um, the reason why I think that this still works and holds water is because obviously this week we have a big uh, FOMC meeting. Uh, also, I think one of the reasons why we're seeing this rally happen is also because it's being driven by what I'm calling, you know, a gamma squeeze. Um, first of all, we can see very clearly here that most of the option trading that took place uh, on Friday or <laughs> the majority of it was all for Friday's expiration date. You notice a huge amount of call volume up at the 4100 strike price, the 4090, 4080, uh, very little in terms of puts. If we go over and look at the SPY, sort of look all sort of for big trades for option expiration on Friday. Also, when we take a look at the uh, S&P 500 one week 50 delta option implied volatility, um, you'll see that typically implied volatility goes in the ops direction of the S&P 500. Here's the S&P 500 in purple. Um, here you can see implied volatility rising, S&P 500 coming down. When implied volatility uh, starts coming down, you can see the market begins to stabilize and rebound when implied volatility rises market comes down implied volatility falls market goes up implied volatility rises market comes down implied volatility falls market goes up then you get a little bit of a weird sort of scenario right here but ultimately speaking implied volatility rises market goes down and then you can see here something sort of strange begins to happen because you have implied volatility rising with the s p 500 rising uh, and then you can see here implied volatility falls, the market actually falls, and then you can see here that implied volatility has been rising again, and the price has been rising again. And this price action is typically associated with gamma squeezes, where you have 
you know, what's called, you know, bid up, you know, market up, vol up, right? And because people are all chasing higher prices and because there's so much call activity going on, implied volatility is generally rising with it. This price action at the end of the day, specifically on Friday, sort of has the look of when, you know, all the call buying ceases, the market just collapses. And that's sort of what it looks like there. So I'm kind of suspicious that this is actually going to continue because um, eventually what how these gamma squeezes tend to end is when you get implied volatility reaching a certain point it is now no longer profitable to be buying calls and once that call activity vanishes market usually collapses underneath it um, and so that's sort of where we are from a market structure standpoint uh, it's not unusual also to see implied volatility sold on a Friday uh, that's typically what happens uh, implied volatility on the VIX uh, finished the day at around 1850. It actually touched the low of the day, came in uh, at 18, uh, I'm sorry, 1797, and that matched almost the low of 1801. What also is noteworthy is that we've seen the VVIX, which measures implied volatility of the VIX, um, and that has uh, been rising. And so when you usually get these divergences between the VVIX rising, like you had here, where you see the blue line VVIX rising, uh, the darker blue line, the VIX is falling. Let's change that to a different color so it's just maybe a little bit easier to see. Um, you'll see that uh, it usually can be a leading indicator to a change in trend in overall volatility. And you can clearly see here implied volatility on the VIX has been rising while the VIX itself uh, which measures implied volatility, the S&P 500, has been falling. And these divergences can lead to changes in trend in the VIX index. So, um, you know, here you can see that VIX index was sort of trading, you know, down here and it started, VVIX started rising. Um, and it doesn't happen so much here, but this was sort of a different period of time. So I would say that you need to continue to watch the VVIX. So uh, this is sort of, you know, again, a warning sign that, you know, going in, to a Fed meeting, you may have seen what I'm calling to be a blow off or final leg of the rally. I, I tend to think that going into this Fed meeting, you are going to see implied volatilities begin to get bid up again on the VIX because that's what the VVIX is telling you. And uh, basically, I think you know it's going to become more expensive if we start seeing implied volatility rising for people to continue to do a gamma squeeze. So I'm basically thinking that we're at the end of the the rally uh, and that we're going to probably see the um, S&P 500 move lower from here. Now, the big thing for the Fed this meeting is going to be about this easing of financial conditions. And um, this is important. So the blue line is the National Financial Conditions Index that's put out by the Chicago Fed. And the red line is the adjusted. And you can see that there's been a lot of easing of financial conditions uh, since we, you know, bottomed in October on the S&P 500. And you can see we're at levels now that go back to, you know, arguably speaking, you know, you could argue that the we're back to levels on certain on these certain measures that are back to before the Fed even began raising rates. Um, and so that's a lot of easing of financial conditions. We're still tighter than where we were maybe in December or February of last year, but we're certainly much easier than where we were at every point after the beginning of the rate hike cycle. Um, and this is leading to, you know, things uh, going up. Uh, one thing that's been going up has been gasoline prices. Um, this is the RBOB uh, future price. It's up about 5.5% this month. It had been up a little bit higher, but more importantly, this leads to, you know, higher unleaded gasoline at the pump and this is up nine and a half percent this month and that's going to probably lead to you know a higher cpi reading on a month over month basis plus as we've kind of talked about you've seen you know at least the first half of the month you've seen you know Mannheim used auto vehicles uh prices begin to show signs of um rising as well here you can see up to one point uh up 1.46 percent this month um we've seen the zillow um rent index begin to show signs of um, reaccelerating. Here you can see that uh, if we look at it on a month over a month basis, it becomes a little bit you know, clearer. 
here you can see the, the first real move higher. Um, and you've also had mortgage rates uh, begin to um, really begin to decline. Uh, and this is leading to, um, you know, higher, higher, um, more, you know, new home sales being done. Uh, we had new home sales uh Here you can see new home sales are beginning to rise off the lows, and this is leading to things like you know lumber prices rising you know quite a bit. It doesn't look like much, but we went from 373, you know, call it here, at the beginning of December, and now we're at 477. That's a, a pretty large um, increase in um, a pretty short period of time call it you know 31 percent in just a month so those are big increases and you're also seeing things like uh, copper prices now beginning to rise rather dramatically and if we overlay that with cpi year over year that's going to show you that you have you know uh cpi tends to um trail copper prices by about three two to three months uh, and so again, this is all sort of telling you that you know as commodity prices rise, you're likely to see um, inflation kind of fed back through the economy, and this is a concern. And Cleveland Fed is looking for um, you know a CPI to rise on a month-over-month -month basis. You know where you were seeing you know signs that maybe CPI was cooling. All of a sudden, you know you may get this uptick. In, um, in CPI in January, um, which would, you know, be, uh, well, if it comes in at 0.6%, that would be the highest reading really since June. And that would sort of, you know, maybe change the market's mind on whether or not we've seen, uh, you know, inflation sort of just continuing to drop as the um, inflation curve is sort of uh, pricing in. And, so you can see that. So um, this is really uh, becomes an important point for the Fed because if it allows financial conditions to ease, um, you're going to probably see more upward momentum in some of these commodity prices. Um, you're going to probably see. Uh, and so this, you know, sort of leaves Powell in this position where, you know, he can let financial conditions continue to ease. He can let markets kind of continue to run he can let the economy you know let the markets leave re lever and you know you can let everyone have a field day again and you know and 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 in very quick order you're going to see commodity prices continue to go up and i think all the issues we've had over the past you know year are going to come back pretty quickly and i think powell's going to be forced to push back against this. I don't think he can allow financial conditions to ease and for this to continue. And so I think that ultimately he's going to have to give a pretty hawkish message come Wednesday. And I think that's going to ultimately be sort of the end of this rally. Um, and you're going to see prices, you know, move lower again uh, because he can't, again, like I don't think he wants to go down as, you know, the guy who, let inflation run away uh, because, I mean, honestly, he stepped in and, and did a really good job at the beginning of the pandemic, making sure that the economy didn't fall off of a cliff. And um, I think he'd rather be remembered for that than for the guy that, you know, allowed, you know, 40 years of disinflation in the economy to be reinvigorated because he, you know, overdid monetary policy along with fiscal stimulus. And, um, and so I think that he, he needs to step up here and, and really sort of rein things back in. And I think the only way he does that is by, you know, telling the market either three ways you do it, right? First way is to raise by 50 basis points, which would really come as a stunner because, you know, Powell has not been one to really who wants to shock the markets. I think the other option is, is that, you know, you do your 25 uh, and then you have to deliver a very hawkish message, basically telling the market that, you know, financial conditions have eased more than desired and 
the unwarranted easing of financial conditions, you know, are ultimately going to lead to the need for more monetary policy and for higher rates. And that if if they don't see conditions begin to retighten again and go in the direction they feel are sufficient to reflect the monetary policy they're trying to implement, that it's going to require rates going above that of the December SEP. Uh, the other option they have, obviously, is to threaten and to begin warning about doing more quantitative tightening, increasing the pace of balance sheet runoff, because that would allow the yield curve to begin to re-steepen. Uh, you would begin to see rates on the back of the curve begin to rise at a faster rate or at least begin to re-elevate it again. And as those rates begin to rise, credit spreads would begin to widen again, and you probably would begin to see financial conditions tighten. Fed doesn't really have many options at this point in the game because they've really kind of let financial conditions get too easy uh, compared to where they had been. And they had opportunities, you know, at the December meeting and even in between the December and February meeting. And they kind of just didn't, the people that needed to deliver the message didn't deliver the message that was needed. And so now here we are. Um, you know, and the other complex is that the other thing that's complex here is that China's reopening. Markets are very excited about that happening. And that's leading to, you know, these additional pressures on commodity prices. You basically have the Western world trying to tighten monetary policy and cool economic growth while you have China going through its reopening process, which is instilling some of these animal spirits where you're seeing, you know, markets in Hong Kong go up in a straight line and uh i mean this is a this is a this is a massive move you've seen in hong kong um in pretty short order and uh as long as you know you've seen hong kong stock market rise 55 percent off of the bottom i mean granted it's still down you know and this is why it's so you know sort of misleading to say markets like still down 27 percent but it's up 55 percent off the lows and so you know, it's like the Hong Kong market is just reflating. Um, and so this is sort of uh, the problem that the Fed faces, right? It has now the headwinds of China reopening and not to mention a lot of the issues, the reasons why, you know, the Fed was able to get inflation to come down like it did was because China wasn't really online. Uh, and so you had the dollar really strengthened materially during that time. And now you're seeing, you know, the dollar begin to weaken against the Chinese yuan. And you can see that we were very, got, you know, the dollar got very strong and the yuan weakened a lot. And you can see that all of those gains are basically wiped out and we're back to levels we were in over the summer months. So, um, you know, if the dollar should continue to weaken against the yuan, that's going to be more problematic because that's going to increase import prices here in the U.S. as well. So... Powell really needs to um, uh, do something here. Otherwise, I think that the uh, short term can become a little problematic because I think the markets will begin to continue to run higher. And if they continue to run higher, I think that ultimately will bring back uh, you know, more inflationary forces and impulses that were, were being kind of uh, tone, you know, that were kind of dissipating and, and showing signs of major improvement. So anyway, that's where we are right now. Um, if you have any questions, you leave a comment. I'll try to answer them. Anyway, have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you later. Bye.